Paul, Paul Benishai. Benishai. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, as Debbie said, my name is Paul Benishai. I'm here um, representing both the Hebrew University and also Ariel University, which is my, uh, my current uh, port of call. Um, this is a summary, if you like, of some of the more recent work we've done in our laboratory with a view on what's happening in, in the world of industry, and in particular communications industry. Um, I, I state at the beginning, we're physicists. We're not physiologists. Um, so this is probably a little bit um, portentous or maybe even pretentious for a bunch of physicists to talk about. But it stems from the following. Yeah, a few years ago, I was in the um, terahertz conference in, I think it was, um, it was actually in Hong Kong. And we sat down and we heard a talk, very nice talk, by a guy from Switzerland showing us a new phantom for terahertz waves. Because there's going to be these new standards coming out, this is a particular wave band, still not really exploited and we can use. So um, it got us to thinking a little bit because we've been doing similar work um, on human skin and how it would absorb um, energy. Um, I've, I've put here an example for you uh, from <coughs> National Physics Labs of one of their particular phantoms. And the idea of a phantom is pretty simple. You, you find something which has more or less the same dielectric properties as skin or tissue. Um, so that you can make a model of your skin or tissue. You expose it to radiation and you can put probes inside, you can measure temperature changes. I've even seen some Japanese ideas where they'll put dyes which will change their color according to temperature. So you can see the distribution of the electric field inside and give some idea about the self-absorbent rates that would be around. Now, that's not a bad idea and it will work under a couple of conditions. Um, and the conditions are, number one, that the wavelength you're looking at uh, be much longer than the dimensions of whatever it is you're trying to model. If you can do that, then basically um, it looks like you have like almost a static field and you can talk about a homogeneous sample inside. You can ignore the actual nitty-gritty of what makes up tissue. Um, you can do something better and much easier and faster if you then go to computer simulation work. And this is a simulation from CST. I've only chosen CST here. Uh, no disrespect for anyone in the audience. It's just simply that was the, the package we used. And there are plenty of other good packages which do, you know, finite element analysis. They'll let you then put in your electromagnetic wave. They will break down your particular model and they will solve Maxwell's equations as per se, as equations at the boundaries of the particular dimensions you've, you've, you've designed, and that lets you really see what the electric fields will be inside, and from there you can understand about energy, and if you make a few assumptions, you can get SAR rates. And that's also, you know, it's pretty good. And, and once again, there are some basic assumptions here. Uh, number one, you have to assume, once again, as you did with the regular phantom, the physical phantom, that the dimensions are going to be, you know, much smaller than the wavelength you're using. Or, on the other side, that your wavelength is much, much, much smaller than the dimensions you're using. Because if you do that, then as far as your wavelength is concerned, you're going into an infinite regime. It's just one boundary, no big deal. Engineers, mathematicians, we know what we're looking at, and it's simple, and we can understand it. Is it reality? Sometimes. Frequently not. But it's good enough for industry to put down those standards which are telling you how much radiation you can be exposed to. What happens when you get to that really bad boundary, when the wavelength of your energy approaches the dimensions of your biological structures? All those assumptions now collapse, and you actually really have to consider how the interaction is going to be. So we started this work way back in 2008, when we'd actually seen images similar to this for the first time of human skin. This is an OCT image of living human skin. OCT is optical coherence tomography. Basically, it's a method of imaging the skin as skin. And uh, what you're looking at is the, the, the upper layer of skin here, the stratum corneum. Um, you're seeing basically this black area is already hypodermis dermis. Um, you're seeing from here to here the living epidermis as it goes up, the boundary really, which many people call the dermis to epidermis until the stratum corneum here. And those coils that you see quite clearly there are your sweat ducts. Um, we have two to five million of these on our skin. 
we have a massive concentration on our hands of 600 per square centimetre. We have a much smaller concentration, 100 per square centimetre, on our back or on our chest. On our foreheads and heads, the back of our heads, we have a concentration of 300 per square centimetre. We are littered with them, and we are sweating continuously. In fact, um, we lose 15% of our moisture all the time through these sweat ducts, even on the coldest of days. Now, look atten pay attention to these dimensions. Uh, 0.3 millimeter, if I put it into nice, easy speak. That's what it is. This is relevant when we start looking at frequencies from 60 gig above 300 gig, or if I talk industry speak, 5G. So now we are actually in the situation where we are going to invest millions of dollars, build fantastic infrastructure, and zap ourselves with wavelengths which will interact with the geometrical structure of our skin in some way. Is there a health implication? And that, uh, that's the big question. And I'm already going to tell you. I, I can't tell you. I don't know. Once again, I'm a physicist. I'm not a physiologist. But I can tell you what we have seen. We started off um, seeing if this would actually be active any, in any way. Um, if I have something, and I'll just go back one stage, if I have something which to a radio engineer looks just like an, a coiled antenna, similar to what you would take out of your radio, would it work like an antenna? And there's one other aspect here. Um, the water distribution levels here, oops, sorry, wrong way, are also quite different. That's why we have light and dark here in this particular image. And that's also a point I'll address a little bit later. Well, so we reasoned and we asked ourselves if it could, and if it could, could we change a reflection coefficient that we would get by bouncing such a signal of someone's skin? We happen to have the ability to do that. We happen to have a very high-end vector network analyzer which could send a signal, anything from 75 gig all the way up to 110 gig, onto the skin of a person and read what comes back. It's a simple experiment, if you put it that way. So what we did, we made a nice little protocol. We, we measured the hands of people while they sat there calmly. Then we made them run around this particular campus two or three times. So they came back extremely stressed, sweating profusely, dried their hands so we wouldn't have any problem, and measured the hand again and looked at what we could see. What we could see resulted in this particular article published in 2008, where we basically stated that these things could work like helical antennas. That the sweat duct was an integral part of the mechanism for the absorption of energy, electromagnetic, between 75 to 110 gig. And that if you changed the character of the sweat duct, i.e. made it work, you could actually change that absorption in some way. And if you could do that, you could then trace how a person is under stress. Um, now, we did a lot of tests to make sure. We even made sure the sweat duct wouldn't work by neutralizing the nerve endings. And we could see the differences. We followed that up with a more in-depth uh, view of this. And we also looked at things like uh, stress, not by being made to run around a campus, but by just being made to think rather heavily. And we could still find traces, and we could still see traces of the stress levels in the reflection coefficient. We've got very nice correlations in, in, in this sense. So, so pretty clearly, um, there is a mechanism, and it's quite nice that at least in that particular frequency level, um, the skin is absorbing, and, and the main, if you like, motivator of that absorption would be the sweat duct. And this is all before we'd even realized that these industry standards were going to come out for 5G. Now, we finally put the nail in the coffin, in our opinion, when we proved there was also curality in the reflection coefficient. Curality is this, this fact that if you send in a wave and it is it's pointing in one way, like this, its electric field is just pointing like this, and it comes back, and it bounces back. That's a nice, simple linear polarization. But if at the same time this thing is twisting as it goes forward, it's what's called circularly polarized. If it hits and comes back, or if you send a straight one, it comes back twisting, then it's significant because it means that there must be something circular in its nature to make it come back that way. And that's what the sweat duct is. So this actually proved that the sweat duct is the thing that's responsible. 
We're not the only people. There's been a few other groups as well who've also looked at it. In fact, using Ezra's se uh, software, uh, Gal Shafferstein also came to the same conclusion, and he went one stage further than us. He actually looked at SAR rates as well. Now, he did this because the American army had commissioned him to explain why their 94 gigahertz crowd dispersal gun made people run away when the beam touched them. This beam is two gigawatts in strength. It's two meters across. And if you are unlucky enough to be standing there when it hits you, you feel like your body's on fire. You will run away, and you will find out that you're perfectly OK, more or less. So they commissioned him to find out why. And he had a, an amazing discovery when he looked at the SAR rates. And he found that, preferentially, the SAR rate was going very high inside the sweat duct as compared to the surrounding tissue. So there's already some evidence that there's a physical influence could be on us from, from him. There's been a few other uh, um, groups as well. Um, our results were confirmed by a group in Queen Mary University uh, by Robert Donham. And finally, there's a very nice guy in Queen Mary University, uh, Akim he's called, who's looking at how we can use the skin as a transport layer send signals through the skin to communicate with devices on our bodies. Why have, yeah, yeah, why, why have uh, wires when you can use the skin? And he also finds the same thing, that the sweat ducts are very, very important in how that signal will be sent through the skin layer itself. So, at least on the level of us t physicists, we recognize that there's something here. Is it significant? Well, that's a big question. Well, let's talk a little bit about what the skin looks like. Um, actually, I probably even shouldn't talk about it. There must be enough doctors here in the audience who can tell me what the skin looks like. <laughs> but the important thing for me uh, is the fact that there is structure. Now, these, these structures, yeah, these papillae, are also on the same basic dimensional level as radio waves from anything from 60 gig up to 300 gig, 5G once again. And, of course, the cells are living here beginning to die, dying, and dead up here. So the water contents are also changing quite, quite dramatically. And in fact, if I just skip through this, I'm not even going to say the names because I'm sure you know them better than me. If I skip through these and uh, come to the gradient of water, which is important if you want to actually then make some form of modeling yeah, about how this could work, it's really water which is probably the most indicative part of what would absorb all that information that I see, at least on the level of the Bedouin in the desert type approach. I'll find something that absorbs a big dipole, and what's the big dipole? It's water. There's a gradient of water, and in fact, we're very fortunate. Um, this, of course, as I say, would lead to a difference in the gradient of, of dielectric permittivity. I should have stated at the very beginning, the whole point of this work is to make a decent simulation model and to see what we can actually find out. Well, if we look at those gradients of water, and uh, these have actually been uh, measured. Japanese did this. They did it for a group of about 10, 20 students. And they measured quite uh, nicely the uh, change of water content as you go down in the depths of the skin. And it looks very nice. In fact, this is the dermal layer up here. It's somewhere around about 70 to 80% water, depending on the person. There is a barrier, which is really that barrier between you know, the, the, the epidermis and the dermis itself, where there's a sudden drop down to about 40%. And then it gradually slopes down until you get to the stratum corneum. The stratum corneum is that 10 micron layer of completely dead cells with about 10% level of water inside. Well, once again, as a radio engineer, uh, that means I have a reflective boundary in terms of, of uh, energy, which means I have the conditions for preferential absorption in the layer. So we started off thinking about this, and, and our first models were very, very, very primitive. We made two layer models like this, a higher dielectric permittivity here, a lower dielectric permittivity here, and our sweat ducts in the model, and we, we tried to see what we could get. And we got some pretty nice results. We then improved this idea, and we started putting in the structure of that boundary between the dermis and the epidermis itself. And that's significant, because these dimensions are very similar, and they have a big effect. Um, and we saw some, you know, nice points, but we didn't take into consideration the fact that this 
area is not homogeneous. And as you go higher in frequency, those additional layers are also important because they also become now the same sort of size as the wavelength. So we, we push this idea a little bit further forward. And um, we have one particular question which we had to answer. If you're a radio engineer and you say, I have something that's going to absorb electromagnetic wave, the very first question you ask is, what's your current source? And it's a really important question. Because as a radio engineer, I know what a current is. It's in a metal wire. It's electrons. This is biology. Biology doesn't have electrons. Not, not really important ones for us. And if you look at the other charge carriers we have in biology, they're ions. And you know what? They move too slowly for the frequencies that we want to look at. So we were stuck. Is there a possible current source? Because we couldn't see one. Turns out there is, although it hasn't really been confirmed experimentally, but there is. Quite simply, we've got sweat ducts filled with water. Water is a remarkable, fantastic stuff. Um, it's not a simple liquid. Beyond having that lovely dipole, uh, it also has something called the Grotius mechanism inside. And quite simply, because it, it layers itself very nicely in terms of structures, let me go forward, um, you can get protons jumping between water molecules along those particular structures that they have. Now, the time constant for that jump is 10 minus 13 seconds. And that's one order of magnitude at least beyond the frequencies we're looking at. Which means there could be a current mechanism, and it's the protons inside water. Where's the water? Inside the sweat duct. We did some estimations, and we first of all measured the conductivity of water at 100 gig, and it's about 100 semen meters. We did some estimations about how much that will be inside a nice, beautiful sweat duct if it's all lovely ordered water, and we came to a surprising conclusion that it could even be higher, or even up to 1,000 semen meters, i.e., there's a mechanism here. There is the possibility of absorbing these wavelengths inside those sweat ducts. If there's a possibility of absorbing the wavelengths inside the sweat ducts, they can be antennas. If they can be antennas, you have to accept what they are. So we made a new mechanism. We made a new model. And this time, this is our new model. We, we've included the dermis. This is the dermis area here. Nicely done. This is really the boundary between what we the dermis and the epidermis. But now we've also included the different layers inside the, dermis, the epidermis itself. And inside there, at the top of the pabilla, we have stuck a sweat duct inside there. And we've taken care that these layers will correspond to the typical gradients of water as measured throughout this particular layer. Now, it's a simple mixture formula to get from the amount of water what the dielectric permittivity should be, which is what you need if you're a radio engineer and you want to know how much energy is going to be inside. So we have that. And we can do that. Um, and uh, we can get some pretty nice, intriguing results. Now, our model here is about a total dimension of a couple of millimeters. The Austin Man has, and Austin Man, for those that don't know, is a full body simulation model for electromagnetic uh, studies. He has a resolution of two millimeters. The Hugo man, that's from CSD, has a resolution of one millimeter. They're impressive computational models, but they won't actually show you this, because this is below their resolution. But it has to be continued, considered. Well, <coughs> with this small model and looking at what we'll get, and that's what the uh, dielectric permittivity change will be through this entire boundary, this is the sort of simulation results we get. Now, what we've done is we've sent a, a signal down and we've checked what comes back to us. And we've done that at various frequencies. And of course, we've done this by uh, uh, computer. And we can see the straightforward layer absorption right here as the standing wave. Now, of course, we haven't taken into consideration anything like perfusion going out of energy or whatever. This is just, these are static passive elements. And we've um, changed the duct conductivity, and this dotted line is if there's no duct there at all. And what we see shows us that there's a change here on this layer. This is true. 
But there's something happening over here and over here, which is because of the sweat duct only, uh, where it is working truly like an antenna. We showed this to industry in, uh, Professor Feldman showed this to industry in 2014, was it, in the BioWireless? 2015, the BioWireless uh, conference. Uh, we cannot say they were happy. Um, that would be an understatement. <laughs> and uh, I think it's safe to say they'll sweep this one under the carpet as far as they possibly can. But what does it all mean? Experimental confirmation. Have we measured anything similar? Yeah, we have. Uh, we use time domain uh, terahertz reflectometry to do this. And this is from a real person who we sent out running. And you can see basically what happens. Uh, here he is. Uh, one minute. Okay. So we've sent a guy out running. And before then we've measured him. And we're showing the reflection coefficient normalized to what we had before he went out running. And this is directly after he comes back this red line. So around about where we saw an effect, we see a quite strong effect here. This is a differential signal, so it looks bigger instead of looking smaller. And it goes down until we get to about half an hour after he's come back, and it almost goes back to the straight line of a calm person. So there's definitely an effect. When we um, compare to the actual measurement, this is the measurement, and that's the simulation, you can see they are pretty similar. So it's not just a algorithmic trick. We measured it. There's just there's something there. There's something happening. And it seems to work the way we would expect it to work if the mechanism for absorption is, in fact, the sweat ducts in that skin layer. Now, we're using very low power levels here. Um, so we're basically just looking what comes back. We're probing. We're not influencing or anything along those lines. So what can it tell us? Well, the next thing you have to go, once you've looked at all this and you, you've noted the differences between everything, is to ask yourself, um, what would it be in terms of SAR? Can you then take the dB absorption, change that into a temperature result, and ask what could be done. Without great luck, uh, it wasn't that long ago that uh, CST brought out a SAR module for their electromagnetic software, so we could use that. And we did. So um, this is the picture we get. Um, and if we just strip away layers a little bit from this one, here we go. So now we're, we're trying to actually cut down through the layers and see where the absorption is. Wherever you see it a little bit closer to the red, that's where the higher absorption is in terms of So the stratum corneum, that will be where the sweat duct actually terminates on the skin surface. It's not particularly great. But as you go down one layer more, you can see actually the absorption is concentrated in, in the sweat duct itself, not, not in the, dermal layer, uh, the epidermal layer itself. As you go down to to four, this is the mixture layer before we get to the low epidermis. You can even make out where the sweat duct is. There's the, the, the twist of the sweat duct in terms of the SAR level. And that simply goes down even more so until eventually there's a dispersion along the boundary between what we made the dermis and the epidermis, and basically the reflection plane itself. So definitely the sweat duct is where the absorption is happening. And this actually tallies quite nicely with what Gal Schafferstein had found way back in 2011 as well. So it's happening there. And this is ignored by industry. When they're making the 5G recommendations, nobody's looking at this. Nobody's even really aware of this. OK. So um, let me just push that a little bit further for you. Hold on. Oh, why's it not going? OK. Yeah. So if you slice through, so you can see the sweat duct planner now, you can see quite clearly where the absorption is happening. What did I just do? Oh, there we go. So it's concentrated there, and it's pretty clear. All right, so let's have a, a little bit look. That's in terms of dB. It's still very much there. It's still quite strong. But if we now actually look at the maximum level of absorption we got, and this is with no duct. That's what we should have got. And that's with a duct. So you can see there is a specific frequency here which actually tallies quite nicely with what would be the end fire mode of an axial antenna of the same dimensions. And it tallies rather too nicely, in fact. And you can see the difference is, is actually quite significant. Um, well, that's the panel that's making the specification for 5G. 
Um, what worries me is that it's basically an industry panel, and it is not independent. Um, and as you can see, they are making quite good progress. And within two years, you said, Darius? Yeah. Two years. We, we should have this everywhere, all over us. And this has not been looked at. Nobody's really considering what health effects could be because of that mechanism, which we've proven to exist. It, it's there. Nobody's really considering what it can be. And with that rather frightening message, I will leave you. Yes? It's a really good question. Um, in some ways, we believe it must do, although we haven't done the, experiment, the true research. What we do know about the skin is, of course, the older you get, the thinner your skin gets. It gets drier. That must have some effect. Um, I must admit, I, I've read a fair amount about sweating. I've never really checked to see if old people sweat more than young people. <laughs> no, the ducks you have are the ducks you're born with. And they're there. The duct itself doesn't really change its property, but the skin gets, get, gets thinner. We lose um, stuff like uh, elastics in, 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 in co collagen, elastin. We lose them. Elastin, thank you, and collagen. So our skin gets thinner. It gets much less tractable. So we still have the same sweat ducts. The, the dimensions do change, but not, not too greatly. We'll still be in this generalized ra uh, range. What will be the effect on us as people? That once again, we're not even quite sure. All the studies that we made were done on a population which was mainly white, mainly male, mainly between 20 and 35. So it's pretty homogeneous. Yes? How does it correlate to polygraph, lie detector kind of results? It correlates rather well. And are you using it? No, we've done that. Now, I didn't go into the actual depths of the, of, of the research that we did do. We've, we've got about eight papers published on this. Um, we cross-correlated our results that we got from the reflection coefficient, not just in terms of time protocol, but also in terms of other physiological markers, like GSR, which is the heart of the polygraph, stress testing, in other words, a pulse rate, ECG. Lying. And we actually started a whole protocol of simulated lying and, if you like, what's called crime scene uh, simulation. We never completed the study fully, but certainly in as much as the GSR can show the change of your stress levels, be it an emotional stress or uh, mental stress or physical stress, there's good correlation to the reflection coefficient. But we found at least decent correlation. Yes. Um, which one? Yes. I see what you're doing here, but, but basically what industry wants is communication. Yeah. Microwave is perfectly relevant for that because it travels through everything but metal. Yeah. But gigahertz, this kind of terror is not going to go through much of anything. So well, here's the big problem. The well, the idea, the, these specifications, they're not really considering them for like wide area cellular networks. They're considering the 5G for basically very high end, high data transmission, at least on the level of wireless inside building, inside room. Now, they can do that. Now, there is a problem at around about 550 gigahertz, strong absorption line from oxygen. 660 gigahertz, strong absorption line from atmospheric water, etc., etc., etc. So they'll concentrate down to about 300. Um, by the way, for those that are interested, there's also quite strong absorption line from alcohol at about 330. So that could also be interesting in certain countries where maybe they drink too much. But <laughs> what it means that in a room such as this, with a wireless system based on 5G, you can push ultra high rates with terabit. Uh, transmission rates of information. So, in terms of what you can get on your cell phone, it's, it's ginormous. However, um, you've got to think of what will be the wattage they're going to be using, and this is the real question. If at the moment you are working with a cell phone which is pushing out milliwatt, and that's problematic, and a base station two kilometers away pushing out 120 watt, which if you're near it can be a killer, yeah, or if you're working in your wireless networks, where once again you're talking about milliwatts power, it's reasonable to assume that they're going to be, I think, four times higher, you said, Darius? Four times higher. What's what going to be four times higher? The typical wireless uh, router in your room based on 5G. In terms of, it won't be quite terahertz, but it'll be the sub terahertz level, but it'll be pushing out, you know, wattage. And I, if you're my there. My understanding is that you need thousands more antennas to transmit 5G than what we have now. That in, within, yeah. 
that you need many, many more antennas precisely because they can't go so far. Yeah, so that's why they're, they're aiming it for basically the wireless network market. Right. It's not for the cellular market as such, but it'll be like, say, in a room like this, maybe you have two or three antennas inside this room. So that you could get high-end uh, graphics on your on your on your your computer or on your cell phone. Right, with, with not any consideration about the potential um, health consequences. Because by know, this particular group, there should be none. But what's what's the big deal? It's just affecting your sweat, right? Um, why why should we be concerned about this as a health issue? We don't know how it affects us. To be perfectly frank, um, we know that we get absorption. If the U.S. Army could use it to scare away people. That's already a bad sign in my particular books. <laughs> um, we don't know how this can really affect us. these devices, they're, they're, it's related to the, uh, the uh, pulse, you know, the, the different kinds of electromagnetic warfare that devices that they've come up with that are designed to uh, repulse people, etc. Well, the, the, the American Army's intention was very, very crude. It was just quite simply to make crowds run away as fast as right. they possibly could the by, by the fact. Do these at all? No. They do not. No. And by the way, the Americans barely use it. They, I think they tried it once or twice in Iraq. It wasn't so effective as they had hoped. And it has a certain amount of problems. It's a large based system and it's not simple to use. So um, we're going to get the next presentation up. And while, while we're doing that, are there any other questions? Uh, Ron? Well, what would be the relative SAR in the melanocytes? First of all, what's a melanocyte? <laughs> Okay. It stimulates m uh, melanoma yeah. and they get right. Well, it's, it's a good question because if we got to the true um, SAR, we'd actually have to consider, as Ezra's pointed out, perfusion. How, how's heat also taken away? But as you can see from the simulation, it shows that very clearly, straight down the sweat duct, that's where, where the highest amount of water is, that's where the biggest absorption is going to be. And then along that boundary layer. So anything which is going to be inside that layer is, is going to be feeling this. Now, how is that going to transmit into a temperature differential and possible cellular damage based on that? This is a great question. For that, actually, I think you need a much more sophisticated model like Ezra has, which can also take into consideration not just the absorption of the energy, but also the perfusion that comes out and what that would actually leave you at the very, very end. And this is just considering a thermal effect, if we're really honest. There could be effects which are far, far, far insidious.